Good afternoon, and welcome to episode four of the Retail Tomorrow virtual series, Brave New Retail World. I'm Patrick Spear, President and CEO of GMDC Retail Tomorrow, and we're happy you've joined us. We've enjoyed hosting you and your industry colleagues over the last few weeks, where we've introduced you to the thought leaders, disruptives, disruptors, and provocative retail concepts that will inform and shape Retail Tomorrow. This series was made possible through the generous support of our Retail Tomorrow annual sponsors. Accelerate, Energizer, Intel, Navajo Inc., and Unilever. When we launched Retail Tomorrow four years ago, we did so with a vision to connect the industry to what's next. And since that time, we've hosted numerous city immersions focused on specific retail themes and centered on meeting the innovators that are creating the future in real time. Following visits to the Bay Area, New York, Seattle, Toronto, Los Angeles, and Boston, we decided to create and curate a virtual experience that will enable you to continue your own innovation journey regardless of your current travel restrictions. If you've experienced one of our immersions, you know they're typically action-packed as we're constantly on the move. Rather than rely on PowerPoints and meeting rooms, we seek out the retail concepts, technology solutions, and innovative products for you to see, touch, and hear. We also partner with technology leaders like Google and Microsoft, innovation accelerators like Consumer Equity Partners and XRC Labs, and universities like MIT and Harvard to bring a broader perspective on the platforms and trends that are enabling massive industry shifts. Today, we've hosted multiple innovation demo days where the Retail Tomorrow community has been introduced to dozens of startups and scale-up companies that are ready to win with retail and CPG organizations. We also produce a weekly podcast hosted by Kevin Koop from Morning Newsbeat and Sterling Hawkins from the Center for Advancing Retail Technology. As we conclude the Brave New World four-part series, participants have come away with the following. Number one, a heightened understanding of consumer behavior, not just in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic, but more importantly, the longer-term behavioral shifts and retail implications. Secondly, a view of not just the most intriguing retail concepts in the U.S. marketplace today, but possible new concepts not yet in our market that will redefine retail relevance in a post-COVID world. Number three, specific insights regarding post-COVID retail implications for the GM and self-care categories. And finally, compelling tools to help leaders develop their organizations and create winning strategies for this brave new retail world. In the coming weeks, we'll produce unique, tangible output including thoughts on a post-COVID shopping experience and store of the future. These will be presented by our friends at WD Partners, uh, contemplating input from series participants, and will debut during our upcoming virtual fall conference. Now I'm pleased to introduce an industry thought leader who has supported our Retail Tomorrow platform from the inception. Neil Stern is a senior partner at Macmillan Doolittle, a published author of two books, and a widely quoted expert on domestic and international retail innovation, serving retail clients worldwide. Recognized as a visionary around future retail concepts, he brings a relevant perspective to the post-COVID retail landscape. Without further delay, I'm happy to turn it over to you, Neil. Great, uh, thank you, Patrick, and welcome everyone to, uh, to uh, episode four uh, of A Brave New Retail World. Uh, we're really excited about this one because it, it, it kind of is the culmination of of the four-part series uh, that we've been going through. In session one, we talked about the consumer and changes that were happening in the, with, the, uh, with the consumer now and what they're gonna do into the future. Session two, we took a deep dive into e-commerce and talked about 10 years of growth in, in 10 weeks and, and where we might be going in the future. In the third session, we turned our lens to, to the world and what could we learn from China, Korea, and emerging markets that could give us hints as to where we're going. And finally, in this session, we, we, we titled it Leadership in an Anxiety Economy, uh, but really this is about the future of work and the future of being a leader. And, and to some degree, all of these sessions lead up to this where we, we know that, um, that the future's upon us, right? And we're gonna have to act and respond differently as we, as we think to the future. Um, what we'll cover today is a brief recap on those sessions. Uh, then Allison uh, Castillo from Unilever will, will share kind of introductory remarks. Uh, as we've had in all of our sessions, we'll have kind of a quick future-facing five to think about uh, the future. And then 
Nancy Giordano of Futurist will talk us about from moving from leadership to leadering, and we'll close with uh, a panel discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce my co-host, who will have a chance to talk in a few minutes, Allison Castillo, who's the Director of Industry Rela Relations and Sustainable Living at Unilever. And she's going to share her own personal journey and the path that her company is taking uh, as, they, as they look to the future. As a, as a quick recap, we kind of started saying we're, we know we were hosting this series in, in unprecedented times. Uh, and, you know, when you look at uh, that, that last quote here, with such sizable disruptions in the market, it's difficult to tally the damage or determine the future. But determine the future is exactly what we set out to do. So we said, despite all the noise that's out there, uh, we want to be thinking about uh, the future and preparing for the future. And I think now is there's ne really never been a better time for doing that. Uh, we talked about the extremes and retail moving to the extremes on value, convenience, and, and experience. And yes, there's question marks what's happening, but we really think that COVID is only going to accelerate those trends that we've been seeing lately in the marketplace. And as we look at e-commerce, it had been there for a long time. COVID just accelerates through that process. Uh, Nielsen talked to us about the future of the consumer uh, and gave us a very realistic and frank uh, look at the future and saying, we're not dealing with just one kind of consumer. There's this notion of constrained spenders and insulated spenders, and that they're going to take very different paths as we look to the future. E-commerce. Um, was moving along in this very steady state until we saw the explosion happen uh, in 2020 and that 10 years of growth in three months. And yes, we might give some of that back in the future, but we also think that it's gonna be with us to stay. Uh, how much so? Uh, Tim Steiner, Chief Executive of Ocado said, maybe it's gonna be 75 to 80% of the market. So if we think we've seen change, we haven't seen anything yet from an e-commerce standpoint. In episode three, we turned our attention to global and said, why should we care about the global market? And a lot of those trends that we've talked about, e-commerce, contactless society, online, offline coming together, they all exist today and they all exist today in a major way across, across big global markets. Uh, we didn't have to go any further than South Korea to see uh, FMCG e-commerce penetration already well over 20% uh, versus 4% in the US. And this notion that new retail is going to emerge that kind of blends together shopping models in ways that we've never seen before. Um, Dan O'Connor talked about this notion of fourth generation uh, online, offline integration and, and really the blending and convergence together uh, of business models. And, you know, we, we do pose all this to say, well, this is the future. But in fact, uh, as uh, William Gibson said, the future is already here. So in episode two, we, uh, we talked about Amazon Fresh, not open yet, operating as a dark store. By the time we got to our, our episode here, Amazon Fresh is now semi-open. So we sent uh, Amanda Lai out there to take a look, and we want to give you kind of a breaking news report on the latest on Amazon Fresh. Hi everyone, this is Amanda Lai here to update you on the latest in retail news. For those of you who joined us for episode two of our series, our friends Kevin Coop and Sterling Hawkins scoped out the, at the time, yet to be opened, Amazon Fresh store in Woodland Hills, California. Fast forward to today, and I'm sure you are all aware that the Amazon Fresh store is now open to select customers. At this time, access to the store is by invitation only, and invitations were sent to Amazon and Whole Food shoppers that reside in the local trade area. Every day, more invitations are being sent out to nearby guests. We were in the area, so we took a quick stop to try to get a closer look at the store. Um, from the outside, the entrance is guarded by security guards and an Amazon Fresh employee that checks people's phones for the invitation. Um, there are instructions to check to see if you have an invitation um, by opening up your Amazon app. And then we also saw that curbside pickup is being readily utilized by the local customers. We took a quick peek inside and saw select customers demoing the Amazon Dash smart shopping cart. The Dash cart is intended for small to medium sized trips that fit into two grocery bags. Similar to Amazon Go stores, customers do not have to check out at a register. They just walk out through the dash line when they are done shopping. Based on what we know, Amazon Fresh has an assortment similar to that of a traditional grocery store. There is an area for Amazon fulfillment services, offering lockers, pickups, returns, and also curbside pickup outside. Similar to a traditional grocery store, there is service meet and seafood counters. 
and Alexa is enabled throughout the store to help with wayfinding. You can save time by ordering ahead at the service counter, and Amazon's private label brands are available for purchase. Stay tuned as we wait for the Amazon Fresh store to open fully to the public. Thanks, Amanda. There, there's a lot to unpack there uh, in the Amazon store. And really what we did is it's just, it's just a glimpse, if you will, uh, of the future and a glimpse of, I think, the, the profound changes that we're going to see happening uh, in the market. And that's really what we want to turn our attention today is if these changes are happening, what's it going to mean for the future of leadership? What's, how are we going to have to be ha adapt and behave differently as we go to the future? And now I'd like to turn it over to Allison, who will kind of share some opening remarks, and let's get to it. So Allison, welcome. Thanks, Neil. So good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining around the country. I am Allison Castillo with Unilever, and I'm responsible for our customer engagement, whether that's at industry events or at our Insight and Innovation Center in New Jersey, or as all of us are experiencing now, all of those things happening in the comfort of our very own homes. Um, but I'm also responsible for driving uh, responsibility or sustainability and purpose partnerships uh, with our retail partners. So as Neil mentioned, we have had uh, already three great sessions uh, with Retail Tomorrow's Brave New Retail World, and I am particularly honored um, to be able to introduce this topic and especially excited for today's discussion on the future of work and leadership. First of all, uh, today is primarily led by women, which should give us uh, some indication right there on the future of uh, this industry and leadership in general. Um, but also that one of my favorite people, Nancy Giordano, will take us on a uh, really great journey of the long-term implications of a lot of the trends that we are seeing today and how that will impact and requirements of the leader's mindset. So recently, uh, the Harvard Business Review published an article entitled, entitled Unilever's uh, Response to the Future of Work. And uh, I know that in uh, GMDC's upcoming fall conference, uh, there will be a deep dive session with Dan O'Connor. So uh, make sure to watch out for that. Um, but so today, I'm just going to touch on a few uh, key points. So while we all know that change is inevitable and that we have you know, not felt that any more starkly as a society than this year, um, but what we need to start thinking about is beyond change and truly changing the way we change. Um, over the last century, we have seen uh, workplace practices change from increasing employee benefits to a focus on process, then on profit. And most recently, the wave that uh, Unilever has especially embodied is one on people and purpose. So with Unilever's beliefs really structured around brands with purpose grow, people with purpose thrive, and companies with purpose last, um, the focus really turned to people. And as of 2019, almost every Unilever employee globally um, experienced a find your purpose workshop. And I know the first indication or your inclination on that is um, that it feels fluffy. And yes, there were a lot of dissenters across the organization going into those one to two day sessions. Um, but it really encouraged everyone to dig deep into what may makes us tick as humans and not just employees. And so this helps set the course for more depth on our individual development plans. It helps uh, open the doors for stretch projects to help employees lean into uh, different uh, passion points. And it also really helped show that more often than not, you can deliver on your purpose while contributing to the growth and overall direction of the organization. So to get a little personal, um, my personal purpose is choreographing progress for impact. And so to take a step back as I was contemplating leaving the industry about seven years ago um, to go into the nonprofit world in order to make a bigger impact, um, I the leadership at the time identified really this great opportunity to bridge the gap between the corporate sustainability and purpose initiatives that we were driving as an organization and linking them more closely with our joint business planning with customers. 
So even before purpose workshops had become a standard at Unilever, the culture of our leadership was already fostering this concept by connecting my purpose with my experience in customer marketing and sales and really created a new role that helped challenge the status quo in something that is so uh, sacred and essential as the retailer supplier partnership in order to drive uh, deeper and more purposeful growth while simultaneously impacting communities at scale. So for me and for many others at Unilever, this progressive thinking uh, around purpose not only helped reimagine the traditional career path, but also helps the organization think differently about the unique contributions uh, of the workforce at large. And I know that some companies are already there that I've you know, had conversations with, some are in the exploration phase of what does that mean, but it is really important um, right now to be connecting uh, more than ever with our employees emotionally. So if this is the now, then what is the next? And that's where I think the HBR article and what we will later hear from Nancy is really one of paradox, that it is about finding these two truths that can live both simultaneously and harmoniously. So for example, this challenge of maintaining the position on purpose-led work and purpose-led growth while also accommodating this growing disruption of IA and robotics, or sorry, AI and robotics in the workforce as the impact of those really become a reality. Um, so I know that none of us have a crystal ball and you know we certainly don't have all the answers, but what Unilever has learned is that the key to being prepared for this future of leadership and future of work as an organization is to truly put people at the heart of that transformation. So how are you equipping and how are we equipping every employee to be future fit, um, whether it's at your organization or another, and while also maintaining flexibility uh, within resourcing. And so what I think this boils down to is as leaders that we have to focus on reimagining everything. Um, so what does it mean to collaborate? Um, what does it mean to ensure that we are offering the most flexibility to our workforce? How are we as individuals adapting and, and really finding a stability and resiliency in this um, feeling of you know, constant change and um, you know, in the VUCA world? And you know, I think what that takes is really embodying this vulnerability and humility um, as leaders. And so we have to break down those preconceived no notions and have this willingness to constantly relearn. And speaking of learning, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to learn from all the other great speakers that we have coming up. Um, so to keep things moving, next up we have Patrick and the Future Facing Five with special guest uh, Julie Lyle. Julie is a global uh, retail executive, board member, and entrepreneur. She has served at senior levels within organizations like Walmart, Prudential, and Barnes and & Noble. And these days, Julie spends a lot of time reimagining uh, the future of industry and with the opportunities and horizons through AI and blockchain. So with that, please welcome Patrick Spear and Julie Lyle. Good afternoon, Julie Lyle, and welcome to the Retail Tomorrow Future Facing Five. Hi, Patrick. It's a pleasure to be here. We're happy you joined us today. You ready for a little bit of fun with the Future Facing Five? Fire away. Let's get going. Okay, first question. Julie, using your crystal ball, what will the U.S. retail landscape look like in five years? Well, I expect that there will be both consolidation and fragmentation, Patrick, uh, across the retail landscape. In, in physical retail, I anticipate that we will have fewer of the huge big box retailers with massive assortments and 60,000 to 250,000 square foot footprints. Uh, we'll still have big box retail, the Walmarts and the home improvements stores, but I don't believe we'll have an abundance of the second tier, like the Bed Bath & Beyonds, the Uniqlo's, the H&M's, um, at least not in their current size and assortment levels. Um, instead, I think that the uh, uh, larger assortments and the varieties and SKUs and colors and sizes and packaging will be more effectively and efficiently handled um, and curated in physical retail. Uh, often, I think we'll see that those uh, broader assortments are represented in mass in online e-commerce, um, but distributed more efficiently for both channels with a flattened supply chain and, um, and improved delivery capabilities. So where there are still large brick and mortar retail environments, I think we're going to see a fusion of 
entertainment, dining, demonstration, or other consumer experiences to fill the space and to draw the footfall. So experience will still matter in terms of creating a, a shopping environment that consumers will want to engage with. Absolutely. I mean, retail is very social uh, and yeah. people are still going to want to touch and squeeze merchandise in certain categories and, and they, they want to get out and have that experience of interacting with product. Excellent. All right. Question number two, which emerging services or technologies are best positioned to inspire consumers on their shopping journey? Well, it goes without saying that artificial intelligence will have the most widespread impact on the consumer. Uh, shopping journey as it will or should improve everything from um, from the, the, the inventory and in stock to marketing messaging uh, and media to the user experience uh, what offers and promotions are delivered uh, assortments planning etc but that said artificial intelligence if it's leveraged effectively should be like most tech that is invisible to the consumer so it to your question about inspiring a shopper journey I'm not sure it will. Um, it shouldn't. It should be invisible and just deliver the, the ultimate experience. For that reason, I would say that gaming and augmented reality or virtual reality is best positioned to inspire shoppers in the retail environment of the future. And I, I say that because well, some, you may have heard some people call it digital, the, the convergence of the physical and the digital right. in the space. Um, and, the integration of AR and VR that can deliver experiences uh, online that mimic physical retail um, and likewise deliver in-store experiences that mimic online shopping, um, I think will will be will have the greatest impact on that overall shopping journey. So maybe it's a, so I said um, inspire, but maybe it's a combination of optimization and inspiration then in terms of the role that AI plays or if we think about AR and VR, so we can both optimize and inspire against the journey. Absolutely. Um, and you, you probably would see a, a recurring theme for me here, and it's um, for most innovative retailers, I believe that they will leverage the technologies to thoughtfully integrate the online, offline channels. Um, we, we know that even today, shoppers don't think of channels when they shop. They simply go for what is convenient or what is an experience that they're seeking. They don't think of online, offline, and segmented. And, you know, essentially, that's, real, that's very consistent with a, uh, what your, uh, your fellow Future Facing Five colleague, Dan O'Connor, um, reported to us in session number three of Brave New Retail World, where we talked about OMO, offline merged with online, and really thinking about what the consumer, consumer doesn't care. They just want it where they want it, when they want it. So uh, we're hearing this from other thought leaders as well. Uh, question number three. How do you see the retailer-supplier relationship changing over the next five years? I see it, I see an absolute acceleration of collaboration like we've never seen it before. And if we haven't learned anything from COVID, we, I believe, will have learned that retailers and manufacturers and distribution partners must work together closely to create these multidimensional uh, dynamic supply chains. That can, that can adjust quantities and qualities, right? Uh, product features, manufacturing, et cetera. So uh, that can adjust both uh, in their production very, very quickly in response to economic shifts or consumer shopper preference shifts for one reason or another. Um, and they will need to leverage the AI we talked about most effectively end to end to create these um, intelligent self-correcting supply chains that can respond to both threats and opportunities. Okay, so that's interesting. Collaboration, um, um, you know, a need for agility. Let's talk about it from a leadership perspective. So question number four, what leadership skills will be required to enable success as the industry evolves this way? So I think insatiable curiosity mm -hmm. and uh, solid adaptability skills and the the expertise to build coalitions very effectively. So you've got to be able to build partnerships and leverage those partnerships efficiently. You've got to be insatiably curious to be able to, um, to jump into new technologies and to constantly be exploring the different things that are happening both inside and outside of retail, but that are impacting consumer behaviors and expectations. Uh, and, and you've got to be able to adapt because the the, the pace of change is accelerating. 
Makes perfect sense. Okay, fifth and final question. This one's a little left field, so have some fun with this one. If you could mash up two existing retailers for shopping formats or concepts to create the ideal future shopping experience, which two would they be and why? Well, I, I would have to, you know, my heart belongs to Walmart. I would have to say that I would, uh, I would combine a Walmart with the, what used to be Brookstone, but I would overlay that with a, a healthy dose of gaming and the AR, VR that you mentioned. So I would imagine, I would, I would uh, combine those three, actually, the two stores and the technology to create an environment where, uh, on in at home in an online ex environment you have a, a virtual reality experience of literally walking the aisles and choosing the products that you want and picking the can up off the shelf and looking at the ingredients and the calorie levels and and whatnot um, and likewise in the store uh, in the physical space you would only have one item of inventory for each SKU instead of 14 colors flavors sizes etc and you would pick it up and look at it or scan it with your phone and see all of the options available to you. And that would be the Walmart and gaming experience. But then like Brookstone, if you recall, Patrick, they used to have this assembly line. So you didn't, there was only one item in the store. Right. The warehouse was in the back and they would pack it and hand it to you at the cash wrap. And I would say that in my ideal environment and future, uh, you would have the opportunity of collecting your items at the cash wrap because they would be pulled and picked and packed in the back of the, of the store, um, which doubles as the DC, or with uh, advanced delivery, it could be waiting for you at home when you get there. I love it. From your mouth to some retail execs ears or some investors ears, maybe we can make this happen. That's outstanding. Hope I get equity. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll have work on that for you. Julie, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, really appreciate you joining us for the Future Facing Five. My pleasure. Have a great rest of the conference. Thanks, Patrick. And uh, thanks, Julie. It was uh, fascinating. Uh, for those who are following along at home, you may notice that there's kind of an active uh, chat and Q&A session going on as well. Uh, we'd love to have uh, uh, people continue to interact. Uh, uh, Interesting, Walmart plus Brookstone. We had, a, we had a early answers, Home Depot and Wayfair, Amazon plus X. Uh, anybody have their own ideas, that would be wonderful. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to, uh, to Nancy and uh, her, her, her background in bio is fascinating, but what I say mostly about Nancy is as soon as Nancy starts speaking, I start writing things down because she has an amazing way of, of, of thinking, about, uh, thinking about the future and, and helping companies uh, in every industry really try to, to rethink and reimagine the, the future. Nancy talks about being better next. And uh, unfortunately, she could take the entire session for herself. She's, she's limited to 20 minutes, but uh, I, I, I love just listening to Nancy and she's now labeled me, by the way, the impractical introvert. So I'm, uh, my wife will agree, or impatient as well, right? My wife 100% agrees with that. Nancy, it, it's all yours, and you know we, we're talking about leadership and leadering. What is this going to mean to be a leader in the future? Just to be clear, I said impatient introvert. Both. <laughs> I felt like you know. I think what's so cool about the Amazon Fresh thing is that it takes these other technologies that we've now gotten used to in other parts of our lives, and they integrate them into this space, right? So it's not so foreign. And so the question is, would it replace people, or does it just give us another option? And for me, or you know, somebody who might be introvert and doesn't want to ask somebody at the counter, or just sees a long line and wants to go figure out another option, just like you do at the airport. Um, I just love that there's that flexibility that gets built in with these technologies, and that's really what the, the future yeah, is. Yeah, I, I think as Patrick said in, in the notes, and or, right? I don't think it's going to be one or the other. It's going to be all, all of the above. So we're all going to want to interact in the future in our own ways, and that's just another way to enable that. So this um, hopefully is just a, you know, a, an amplification of what Allison said about purpose and what Julie has talked about with integrating these technologies and being insatiably curious and imagining that these different worlds can come together to create something that we haven't seen yet. Right, it isn't easy necessarily about two existing retailers. I love that she brings gaming in, brings a whole nother dimension to what it is we can do. So to be able to think like that, right? What does it take? You know, in the chat we were talking about it can be scary, but I, you know, really spend a lot of my time helping organizations understand what is or, or imagine what is possible and navigate their way there. And even if I can tell you that you can take gaming and blah blah, there's so much resistance. And so the question is, how do we change the way we think? Um, throughout that article about Unilever, it's a lot about mindset shift. And that's really where I um, am spending a lot of my time these days. So I will 
um, do the really clumsy screen share thing. Sorry, it's not as um, fluid. And we have too many slides for too little time. So at some point you might just cut me off my friend and decide that I need to like shut up. So we have free reign to do that. We are all friends here. Um, but let me go into presenter mode. Um, and the reason I use, I mean, I was really trying to figure out how to do this without slides, but I really do think it helps to kind of codify some of this stuff when I say it. So even the slide here, the entry slide says 1%, right? Prior to the um, pandemic, when you asked the designers and the technologists and the entrepreneurs who were creating the future, they said 1%. I don't know if you guys remember this, but when we were in the Bay Area and we were at Google having this conversation around the future of retail and we asked how far are we in, they literally said 1%. Right, and then a year later, I went and talked to a 3D printing manufacturing company or at a different manufacturing company, and had a conversation with them about where they said they said one percent. So, the, you know, the pandemic has accelerated us maybe to two percent, um, but we still have a long way to go. And so, to be able to really harness this, um, oh, the other quote actually from LA from um, our immersion there was a Walmart executive. He said, "Retail will change more in the next five years than it has in the last 50." Right. Well, here we are, my friends. Right? He warned us, we know this, this is coming. And so again, how do we build a way of thinking so that we don't get scared by that, but we get excited about that. So um, I'll defend why leadering, but just quickly again, for context, I would think it's important to step back for a second and say, this isn't just about the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, we knew that the odds of failure were increasing. A BCG study came out at the beginning of the year about how to thrive in the 2020s and forecast that one out of three public companies would cease to exist in its current form over the next five years. So that current form is a really important part because what we're seeing is the adaptive and you know, imaginative companies are thinking about how they change their form in order to stay here. And I think to Allison's point, purpose becomes a big part of that. Um, but if you don't, then you're that much more likely to be, um, become obsolete and irrelevant. Um, and if that isn't scary enough, then there's also a profitability gap, right? The, uh, those that were at the more innovative and are taking some more of these risks and have been preparing more for the future and thinking about how to change their cultures to be able to absorb that are the ones that are, um, you know, uh, becoming further ahead of their competitors. So those to me are good motivations. So then the pandemic rolls in, right? And again, technology advances, information grows, culture shifting. We learn a lot more about exponentiality, which we had sort of not really fully paid attention to, but things can come out of nowhere that suddenly we um, had not paid enough attention to and have a huge impact on us. So we hit there and started to think about, okay, well, I don't have a magic, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, right? But I do have a really good compass. So if North Star is my purpose, then what is my compass? My compass becomes these two questions, our understanding and a curiosity, back to Julie's point about what the future needs and expects of us. And we spent some time thinking about that. Um, and then we reflect on what we're each in a unique position to create and contribute to that. Uh, that's the strategic roadmap the best I can describe it. But when we think about that second question, it's as an individual, it's as teams, it's as an organization, it's as an industry, it's as a society, our nation at this point, right? We can think about how to answer that question. It really is um, the way that we navigate in real time, the way we learn to sense and respond is that we think about what's going on and then we think about our response to it. And we do it across these lenses. Anyone who's seen my presentations hears me talk about this, but I think it's becoming even more poignant now that we don't just approach this as professionals. We're also humans that are going through this as sons and daughters and mothers and fathers and community members, um, and we're members of society. And the boundaries between those things have become more and more porous as we think about both the externalities of our actions and the opportunities of our actions. We recognize we have this opportunity to have a really huge impact on people or with people. So I'm just gonna take you like, whip fast through the four forces uh, that are shaping the economy as a result of the pandemic. Again, all of these things uh, were in play prior and they just became more amplified. And I think about them as awakenings. What we choose to do with them, you know, is what we will do. So the first obviously is a digital reliance for work, well-being and social continuity. People describe that as the fourth industrial revolution that we're heading into. I would say it's the fourth productivity revolution. Right? We don't need an industrial model to talk about what's happening in a digital frame that's happening next. It's really about increasing productivity and then distributing that productivity in effective ways. And again, I will say only 1% in, so buckle up. Um, if you want to know more about it, actually, I do recommend this book. It's a really fast read, but it's a, a great view of the 10 technologies, the exponential technologies that are emerging and converging and the impact that they will have on a whole host of industries, including retail um, and healthcare and finance, et cetera. And if they don't think about the societal implications or the human implications or all the employment implications that Unilever has so thoughtfully um, dug into, but it does give you at least a quick overview. And it makes you just think more future literate. It's really important that we understand this stuff is real. Um, so the second is the attention on systemic biases and growing inequities. We certainly can't ignore at all um, the social uh, justice movements and the, um, just the awakenings around both racial, 
and uh, ethnic injustice and also gender uh, that had been happening prior. And we're seeing it again as the uh, pandemic rolls through and we're watching people try and navigate their home lives and their unpaid work with their paid work. And we're thinking about how to manage this all so much better. And it's not just a pandemic induced issue. We're recognizing it is systemically built into our economy and into our society over hundreds if not thousands of years, to be quite honest. And we have to really rethink and rewire all that. So the goal right now is to go for equity justice and accessibility, right? Making sure that everyone has access to the same things. One of my favorite quotes around this is that we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. And just having empathy for that and understanding that I think we're becoming much more aware of. Um, the third is the appreciation of um, our impact, our consumptive behavior on planetary health, both our impact on the planet and the planet's impact on us. So we saw, you know, as the world ground to a halt and closed uh, from manufacturing to flight to retail, um, that the planet got healthier. And you took a big cleaning, uh, cleansing deep breath. On one hand, you think that's great, but it came at a really high cost economically. So how can we figure out how to uh, navigate that in better symbiosis, right? So there's a strong economy and a healthy planet. That really has to be the goal. I mean, the numbers are so extraordinary. And the fact is we see that it makes a difference about how we behave. We also saw that people who lived in areas with poor air quality were more impacted by the virus. So that planet also has an impact on us. Right? We're just being much more sensitive to that and hopefully we'll build much better solutions and better balance. Um, and the fourth is a much deeper understanding of ourselves right? and um, our capacities, our support systems. We look around and say, who has got our backs? Right? We talk a lot about resilience. We talk a lot about uh, certainly mental and emotional health is a hugely important part, but it's not just an individual. We sit inside systems of families, communities, employers, brands that we um, trust or don't trust retailers that have had our back in moments when we really needed them to, and you know the government, uh, both state, local, and federal. We think about like who can we trust and who can we rely on, and in some places where it's failing, where do we turn then to uh, a better understanding of how to navigate and feel solid? <clears throat> Whoops, I made something. Um, the one that I think is a bonus that we don't talk enough about that's actually happening right now too is that we have a generation that is, you know, growing up here, Gen Z, uh, that is empowered with a social brain, right? All of their um, decisions are made in collaboration with their friends. Um, in a coming age of disruption, reinvention, huge responsibility, right? This idea of an earth, a youth quake, like the vote's going to be really interesting to see what happens with 18 to 24 year olds um, in this coming election, but it's coming at a price that I think we have to really, really pay attention to. There's this increasing levels of anxiety. We knew this again pre-pandemic, but it's only gotten worse. Um, the New York Times just uh, did, a, 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 did a story about a report that came out and just showed, and I just think it's really important that we take a moment to think about this, that almost 63% of kids in this age range, 18 to 24, are exhibiting symptoms of anxiety and depression, and 25% have seriously considered suicide. We are not a healthy society if a quarter of our young people don't feel safe on this planet right, and feel hopeless or don't feel like they've got, they're well held on it, they don't feel well supported. So I do think that as much as we talk about the pandemic and we talk about the economy and we talk about the climate, I think this is a really, really important part that we need to help our youth build more resilience around this future and show them that it is actually a really amazing future. I think the future is extraordinary and it's, got, it's filled with opportunity. We're shaping it in real time, like we're shaping it right now. So the narrative I want youth to have is that the future is under construction by us right? And that we have all a place in it. This is not being done by someone else. And this is what's going to build it, right? Is all these technologies are going to, again, converge and emerge and uh, shape every single domain of life, from education to retail to relationships with families to how we think about how we move everything. We just did a project in which we imagined the future 50 years from now with a client. And we went through all the domains and the ways in which all of this would shift, both the shift, the awakenings that we just talked about, the forces, matched with these technologies as we become hopefully much more aware of how to build ethical, fair, just um, so solutions that you know hold, hold people well and, and make for a clean and uh, thriving society as we move ahead. So I just think, uh, you know, I can't do a talk like this without having at least some experience for a second about imagining what the future could look like. So if you imagine that these four things, these are headlines from the future, you just take one second and for imagine which one was not true. Right, that by 2030, the number of cows in the U.S. will have fallen by 50%, collapsing the beef industry, or that a space hotel is being uh, conceived that promises fake gravity in a supersized basketball court, uh, or that robots help perform the first long-distance heart surgery, or that a sturdy house can be 3D printed in less than 24 hours for $7,000. So y'all can put that in the chat. I don't know that I see it, but I just think it's one, two, three. Uh, the fact is, they're all true. 
right? Um, we are seeing a huge disruption in both the beef and dairy industry. Many dairies have already gone into bankruptcy because we're moving into plant-based meats and thinking about it from our sort of personal health and planetary health. And that will continue to increase as we're able to grow plant-based foods so effectively in all kinds of environments. Um, there is a space time to have, there's a whole race space right now space thing, both like low orbit and then all the way up to Mars. Um, and this is um, proposed to be open by 2027 if you want to take your ride to space. Um, I think it's breathtaking that a robot could help do long distance surgery on a heart, right, which then opens up all kinds of capacity for people to have accessibility again to medical care in a way that we couldn't imagine before if you couldn't travel to that destination. So now we can open up that kind of thing. So you imagine again what's possible with these technologies. Um, and then finally, you can, you can print a house right now for uh, between seven and $10,000, and it's that house. Like that is a 3D printed house from a company here in Austin called Icon that's working now with another organization called New Story to build, low, uh, to build communities for people who don't have enough um, safe and dignified shelter. So you start to imagine again the solutions can then happen as we start to take these technologies and move forward. So again, if, uh, to your point, Neil, if you're a sheetrock manufacturer, that's really scary. If you are in the affordable housing business and trying to figure out how to deal with you know, the homelessness issue that we've got growing in our cities right now, it's a phenomenal solution, right? So I think it's about your lens and how you sort of bring it to it. So this brings us then to the work that we're all trying to do. The tricky part about this is that the enterprise of the future will require our attention in all of these areas. We don't get to just pick one, right? We have to actively address climate stability. We have to accelerate talent development and upskilling, right? The really big, one of the big, uh, the biggest stats, the two actually biggest stats out of all of our emergence, Patrick, first was the 1% from Google. And the other one was from Dan O'Connor when we were at Harvard and he talked about the percentage of the population will not be able to be reskilled or upskilled in time. You know, he threw out a crazy number that we haven't been actually able to, to get right to the source of, but it's from the Future of Work Institute at Harvard that is roughly, I mean, they say 38%. I hope they're so outrageously wrong. But even if, again, if it's 30% or 25%, that's a huge number that we need as a society better prepare for. Um, in a lot of ways. Oh, my God. It's a huge it's just, number. I mean, and you talk about anxiety already on the planet. Like, let's yeah. just think about what happens there. So we have to really become much bolder as we think about that, right? Uh, we talked again about systemic biases in our organizations, gender, race, ethnicity, age, able-bodiedness. I mean, there's a whole range of things that we need to become much better and much more thoughtful. And we're also realizing that diversity increases our ability to be innovative, right? So that's, it's not we're doing it because we're benevolent. Uh, we're doing it because it actually makes our company stronger when we bring in that kind of diverse um, contribution. Uh, but we're also, again on the list, right, investing in digital transformation, new technologies. AI will be the transformative technology coming out of this moment, the same way that the internet was out of the 2000 recession and mobile and social were out of the 2008 recession. We strongly believe that AI will be the technology that really transforms business and society coming out of this one. And those that are experimenting early will have the advantage and the lead because, you know, AI, differently from the other ones, is based on data. And the more that you're able to harness data, collect data, understand your data strategy, and figure out where that's coming from, the more ahead you will be faster because it's exponential. So uh, we got to take on that. Oh, and by the way, that will also then transform our business models and our revenue delivery, right? It's not just that we're bringing the technologies in, but they open up all these new opportunities for think about business differently and lines of business differently. You know, just an example, Bridgestone Tires put sensors in all the uh, airplane wheels, and now they have a whole business in being able to collect that data and sell it back to the airlines, right? That was a business... Uh, that didn't exist before, that exists now. So those are the kinds of opportunities as we look forward into the integration of these technologies. Believe me, Amazon is collecting a lot of data from their internet store. We certainly see it already in uh, China with what they're doing with HEMA. So in order to be able to do all that, right, this whole list, we got to be able to cultivate a more resilient, agile, respectful culture, right? People need to feel well held inside organizations. And I really encourage people to read the entire Unilever article, it's long, uh, but it is so thoughtful about what they're trying to do with talent strategy and being able to hold people really well and develop the skills, not just you know, do the job uh, for the future, which I think then contributes hopefully to the last one, which is the fortifying overall well-being of self, teams, and society. You know, I actually am doing three talks today, which is the first time I've tried to pack in three in a day. And I finally just took 15 minutes earlier today and did a yoga, online yoga for free, yoga with Adrian. Um, I did 16 minutes about yoga for anxiety and it totally works. Right, so we just have to learn to be able to like, like turn it on and turn it off when needed. Because we're in like a massive marathon. It's like trying to sprint your way through a marathon. It doesn't work. So you have to figure out how to um, take really good care of yourself and others, so that this mental health crisis doesn't get any worse than it is. 
So that's why you lead to this idea that the key to be able to do all this is to develop our AQ, our adaptability quotient. This is a concept from Amir Tufani, um, one of my singular university colleagues. And I think it's just a brilliant way of thinking about all these various skills that we need to uh, cultivate. So I'm kind of rounding out here as we get to leadering, one of the really key parts of really shifting the changing the way that we change is rethinking risk, right? It is a big concept of all the things that we built to contain risk in the 20th century are now the things that I would argue are strangling us in the 21st. And if we don't get a handle on it, we'll create more problems and more externalities than we did in the 20th century, right? Because again, exponential technologies are more potent than I would argue that air pollution or plastic pollution are. It's really extraordinary what we have um, the capability to learn and to do. So we've got to think about it differently. So things like silos that we did to constrain, right? We're in centralization are now a real danger. We have to open up to ecosystems. We have to be able to work with people. Just putting people in these you know, buckets that they only work full time for us and realizing that there's much more flexible ways in which people can work with us. So I can go on and on about all the ways that we can think about even boards, honestly, the way they're structured. Um, thinking that the people who have the most tenure are the people who are most uh, able to comment on a shifting and dynamic world is maybe outdated thinking, right? I think that there's, again, um, a better range of input. So I say we need to ditch the playbook. Everyone wants to know what the next chapter of the playbook is. And the fact is we're moving from playbook to practices. That's really what we mean about leadering. We do not have a playbook anymore. We don't have a map. Again, we have a compass and a North Star. So I describe that as moving from leadership to leadering. And here's my definition of the two. I think leadership was a model that was created um, for the 20th century that was static, closed, hierarchical on purpose as an organizational approach to scale efficiently in order to consistently deliver short-term growth, right? It worked brilliantly until the mandate became innovation. And then once the mandate became innovation, this doesn't work. It's too calcified, it's too rigid, it doesn't focus on the right things. And we start to recognize all these in, you know, industrial breakdowns around environmental and ecology and well-being. These aren't designed to, to focus on that. So leadering, I propose, is a verb, right? It is a cultivation, it's a dynamic, adaptive, caring, inclusive mindset for which that supports continuous innovation for long-term stable value. So in some ways, we're just inversing it, right? Before, it was like we spent all this time in R&D and making sure we're really right before we got out so we constantly were able to like, generate profitability. And now we're going to do much faster innovation, iteration to long-term sustainable value. Right, we're going to take a much longer view on this, which again, is a, Unilever has been such a leader in, in this place, replacing short-term earnings and saying, hey, we're here for the long-term. Right? That's a giant signal to the industry that we need to think differently about how we move forward to be able to create sustainable value. Um, I've been writing a book on this. I can talk about this for now, hours and hours and hours, but the way we describe it is that how visionary leaders play bigger. It's really this collection of practices. Again, not a playbook, but practices. So in closing, I'll just sort of say it moves from predictability to curiosity. I could not agree with Julie Moore. Marianne, uh, Maria said that when we were talking about it at Intel, um, that this is the number one thing. Anybody who will tell you in this world just, but it's not just about being curious. It's about opening up and incentivizing that inside our organization. So everyone has the ability to learn and be curious and be able to activate that. It's moving from efficiency to empathy and how we design things and putting humans at the center of it. Right? The fact that we had a law that said that cloping is a bad idea is we're not in the right place. Right? The fact that we want somebody to close the store at midnight and open it again at 5 a.m. is inhumane. So if we designed that with empathy, we wouldn't make those choices and we wouldn't need the law. Um, again, from silo to ecosystems, from extraction to contributions, we're not just about doing it for our own benefit, but we're doing it, again, as a member of society and the purpose that we want to be um, structured toward. We stop thinking incrementally and we think audaciously, and Patrick knows that I'm a giant champion for this as we did our own uh, initiatives inside GMDC to, to evolve and thrive, but to do it in a way that was bold and, and prepared us well, actually, I would argue, for the moment that we're in right now, and that we shift again from a growth mindset at all costs to a thriving mindset, so that all are able to thrive, and for the long term. Um, I love this quote from Amelia Earhart. The most difficult thing is the decision to act. The rest is merely tenacity, right? Once we are able to step in and say, I can do this, Right? Yeah, it takes support, it takes tenacity, it takes confidence, it takes a lot of things, but the first is to believe that you have the confidence to act and they can jump into it. And that is it. Shaboom! I don't know how long that now, was. Now you, now you get to take a breath, just, just one. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I usually start these talks by inviting everyone to take a deep breath, but I didn't have time. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I awesome. think um, it's just, it, you know, so Nancy, every time I, I listen to you, I'm, I've got my head down writing down things. Um, 
there's there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I know. And I, it's it's um, I would say it's simultaneously scary and exhilarating. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of fear because there's there's so much that needs to change that we, we need to do. I, I, I was going to throw it to Allison a little bit because you know you're you're in this ginormous company <laughs> called called Unilever, right? With divisions and global and uh, all these parts and pieces. As, as you as you start to think about this challenge, how do you you know? As she says, the first decision is to act. I know you you started to act. Kind of what's the what's the journey been like? And and you know if you're <laughs> If we're one percent, where are you on that journey today? I mean, that's a great question. Like you said, a very large company. Um, but you know, I think I think is a lot of the things that we talked about before, and all of the things that are included. And in, you know, we have we'll have more opportunities to unpack the Unilever case study um, around thinking about the future of work. But it starts at the top that we need our you know key leaders in a position to have again that not only their own resiliency but wanting to ensure the over overarching well-being of not just the organization but the people that are within the organization and then beyond that society as a whole and the planet that we all live in so i think i love what you know nancy said is that it's all of these things must be true that we can't we can't choose the one um, and offset for leaning into another, we have to consider the big picture. And, you know, and that, that means that well-being of, you know, of all of those aspects. And, you know, I touched on, we talked, we talked about purpose, but I think that that really becomes prevalent across, uh, across all of those aspects to ensure that you have that, that future fit for your leadership, for your people, and for your organization. And I think that's what starts to reduce the anxiety, right? I think, again, we haven't had, most companies aren't built purpose-led. And so there isn't a North Star and it makes it harder to know what the decisions are. But all the companies that did think about purpose and values and corporate culture and communication within that organization were so much better prepared to know what the right thing was to do when this happened, right? Both inside their organizations and to the society of which they're a part. And that's why I say, again, if you start to orient away from the stuff on the left, because if you're really measuring right now against predictability, efficiency, centralization, extraction, incremental growth, it is a scary time because those things are no longer relevant. Right? But if you go toward curiosity, empathy, collaborative ecosystems with you know, contribution as the center of purpose, right? and you think about audacious ways you can take gaming and bring it into Walmart with Brookstone, right? then you're able to thrive. And that's the part that I think is exciting. And that's the narrative that I think we want people in this call or in this session to, to walk away with and hopefully share with others. Because I think others are really scared right now. And the opportunity is to relieve that. And I think when people are scared, they make really poor decisions. right? When they feel confident, they make great decisions. So, how can we increase confidence? As one of the uh, one of the attendees kind of asked the question of, of who is who is audacious, right? I mean, if, if you're looking out in the world and, and Nancy, you're working with lots of companies. I mean, who do you, who do you who do you believe? Yeah, what kind you can of talk about the little companies, companies, right? You can talk about the comp the little companies like Gravity Payments, and the CEO decided to give himself a lower salary so he could make everybody else be at seventy thousand dollars a year, and their company is thriving because people feel again really well held, and they're able to buy homes, and they're able to go to doctors, and he hasn't tried to push down the wage for everybody. So you can look at all the small ones, but I think you get excited about even Microsoft and the U.S. military, right? The biggest ones, or even Siemens. Siemens just decided three hundred eighty thousand employees that they're going to let everybody work from um, from home, and they might come to a corporate base two to three days a week if they want to, but they basically decided we trust you and we're focusing on outcomes not on the way in which you know the we, we track you that's audacious to me that's huge right because it signals to everybody else that other people can do that microsoft did a giant hackathon where they came in and changed the culture they changed a giant like the culture of a hundred and something thousand employees at microsoft to get out of silos and into collaborative thinking and into innovation and making that part of everyone's job and i will say if you study the u.s military and what they're doing right now with the future command center here in austin and their desire to move out into the public sector and work with universities and entrepreneurs and technologists to bring some of that technology in and they're completely revolutionizing including 3d printing food for soldiers like i think it's phenomenal you know it's fascinating and so it shows you big big organizations that have the right mindset and the right leadership um, and the curiosity and are building those relationships with people outside of their organization are the ones that are thriving wow that's the, the other thing and allison has not asked you on this because we, we were talking before the panel and you're, you're home and you yeah, you have a baby. We pre-pandemic, we I would say we almost use shields, right? We you know we we dress a certain way, we go to an office a certain way, and 
and the one thing that pandemic does has done is it, it's shed it's made us humans right because we're all we've all had people walk in during the middle of a zoom call or you know we, we've become humans in this process it, and and allison you kind of shared your own you know personal statement where where does where does like the human play play a role in unilever and how do we you know how do we kind of un, unbottle that if you will yeah, I think the humanizing of work is, you know, has been just an incredible unlock for, I think, a lot of people and feeling like you can, like, we actually don't have a choice now, but to bring our whole, whole selves to work because our work is in our homes. It's where we're living. And, you know, we were, we were joking that this, um, this session ended up working out really well, but it was during baby's nap time, so I didn't have to worry about hoping, um, hoping, yeah. <laughs> about the interruptions. But but at the same time, those interruptions have become a part of just who we are and being able to see, you know, I'm sure both Patrick and Nancy have been on a call that, you know, my daughter, my five-year-old comes up and just wants to wave and say hi. And like, that's, I, I think there's also a piece that it then gets to, I mean, for me as a mom of small children and especially a young daughter wanting to see she gets to see a part of, of who I am on the work side as well. So I think there's benefits to both sides that, you know, not only work gets to see a bit more of who I am, but my family gets to see a bit more of who I am in this world too. And I think the structures are going to shift around that because I think we've also tried to fit everybody into what I would argue a pretty rigid, somewhat paternalistic male masculine structure that didn't assume that there was care work that needed to be done or somehow it was gonna be done by somebody else. And that's one of the big conversations we're having in society right now is how we look at that in a much more just way, right? Oxfam did a study that showed the amount of care work that is, if you look at the economic equivalent, is $10.8 trillion that is not included in GDP and not included in any framing of what the economy needs, and yet the economy would not run without it, right? And so there's a whole conversation about how we make work more humane, we make it more flexible, we make it less synchronous, right? So that we have expectations. A whole conversation right now about shorter work weeks. Again, audacious. Microsoft was testing four-day work weeks instead of five or shorter work days because the kind of work we're doing is not assembly work on eight to you know, six schedule. So all those things now I think are becoming more, uh, people like us have been advocating for a while around that and to be more curious around that, but I think the pandemic and people seeing real life has made that more, um, accelerated that conversation, which I think is great. We only have a minute or two left. Patrick, I'm going to throw it to you. We, we've had in each one of our sessions something called keeping it real. <laughs> and, and keeping it real is like, all right, you know, GMDC has a mission, and, and it's how do we get retailers and suppliers together to act more collaboratively. This this is, and again, this you only have two minutes to answer, not two hours, but I imagine the future of GMDC is really going to have to be built around how do we make this happen. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Neil. And Nancy and Allison, just a fabulous session today. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I was looking at some of the words that Nancy had up there, predictability, efficiency. You know, look no further than Six Sigma and Lean, and having led an organization through a Lean transformation about a decade ago, I understand the, the importance from a manufacturing perspective of predictability and Lean, but then look, you know, fast forward 10 years to COVID and empty store shelves because we run everything just in time. And what that leads to is friction between retailers and manufacturers. And while we, for now, are moving through that, Neil, the future for retailers and suppliers has got to be different. We have got to, to shed legacy mindset, everything focused on predictability. I answered in the chat earlier, you know, who is going to evolve and adapt and innovate? Well, it's likely somebody that's privately held and not publicly traded because Wall Street analysts don't have the patience for risk or for experimentation, right? So whoever's going to break through is either going to be privately held and really strong regional operator that thinks differently about relationship, or it's going to be Amazon. And we, what we have to do with those that are publicly traded is get a mindset that says we have to embrace risk. We've got to change the conversation. We've got to change the dynamic. And to Allison's point, we have to think about it as the whole person. We all show up with our whole selves, okay? And COVID has forced that on us. Are we, are we working from home or are we living at work? It's two sides of the same coin right now. And all of us have to think about that. We're living from home. I think we need to be really careful. So we are not working from home in the way in which you know, children are in school and taken care of way working. Yeah. We are living, yeah. lifing from home. Yeah, that's a great point, Nancy. So Neil, I think the conversations have to change. And the four words that Nancy talked about, and I already created an acronym, acronym is <laughs> DACI, uh, Dynamic, Adaptive, Caring, and Inclusive, right? D-A-C-I. <laughs> We've got to bring that mindset, right? That's my mic drop. I'm out. Daki. Daki, yeah. Mic drop. All right. Yeah, yeah. Love it. 
<laughs> All right, uh, we've, we've, we've used our time. Uh, again, Nancy, I could listen to you for another couple hours and I probably will on future events. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing the insights with us and just getting us started on this uh, conversation and Allison uh, as well. This concludes our, our four-part series. Uh, Patrick, I'm very uh, hopeful uh, that we will be doing more of this in the future, but we want to thank everybody for, uh, for attending and listening in. Thanks so much.